Okay, Harry, now you mentioned your book a couple of times, and somebody gets mentioned more than a couple of times, and it is your mate, Glenn. Um, can you go a bit more in depth about Glenn and his background and your friendship, how it's endured over the years, and what you, you know, how you sort of collaborate? Well, Glenn's background is pretty simple. He, um, he left school at 16, and he went to work with his dad as a painter and decorator for, I think it was a week or 10 days, and that was it. He went racing every day and uh, drove his old car around and he, 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 he used to literally go, there wasn't no Sundays, but six days a week, he'd drive to Stratford or Exeter or Taunton, whatever the nearest race course to, to, to where he lived in Fairham with his mum and dad. Um, that, that's where he went. So I bumped into him on a race course and, he saw, you know, I was, I was looking back on it when we talk about pissing in the park. I, I used to drive everyone out at the races. I mean, Steve Mellish was good mates with Glenn and, you know, we'd, there'd be five or six good judges that every day I'd go race. And even going 25 years ago, I'd be asking Steve Mellish and Glenn, and um, we'd get, then we'd go in the ring and Kenny Patterson would be there. Everyone, all the people that still go racing now, they were all doing it 25 years ago. And in those days, there was less, you know, it was easier, there's more mistakes in the It was easier to win a few quid, no doubt. But I caught him on to Glenn very early, and uh, and I always described him as the, as the, you know, Glenn's a shy lad, and Glenn doesn't really not shy, but he don't, he's a quiet sort of lad, and I'd always introduce, this is Glenn, the greatest horse jumps in the world. And, uh, you know, and I, I was right. And um, so that, that's just, that was just more luck than anything else, but we've been together ever since. And I don't do that, I've never done this for the last 15 years, I just do what I'm told. He'll just literally ring me and say, we're having this on this, this on that, and that on that, which is fantastic for me, because I was never, I was never, that good a horse judge anyway. I fancy me own, I'd have a very strong opinion maybe four or five times a year. And I'd normally be right. I was quite good at novice chases. Uh, I went a lot of horse racing myself as a youngster, but I wouldn't be good enough to, 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 to day on day to make. I wouldn't be able to price up a horse and say, this should be nine or four and it's four. No, I'd just be good at what I am in most things, spotting the superstars and getting on anti post and stuff like that. And now and again, being right about a novice chaser. But, um, um, you know that that's, that was my limit, so I very quickly catched on to Glenn and and oh, 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 I just do what he says, and that's it, really. Okay, now you've um, you told me on the phone when we were talking yesterday a wonderful story about the two superstars of the turf. Do you want to tell us that so everybody? Can oh enjoy well, it? I don't know about that. I mean, well, they were, they were, they were. They were uh, we were talking what it was. You were talking about the. Um, being a, me being synonymous with short odds, big odds on punning, and I was, and um, was for was for twenty odd years. But that game's completely gone. And I, I I said to you when it was completely gone, it was during the career of Frankel and Black Caviar, and literally when Frank the year the, set, the penultimate year of Frankel's career, there was still plenty of value in the races he was in. Of course, different style, type of horses as we'll talk about, but Black Caviar the same. Black Caviar was. Even with not evens, but two to nine and five on and six on and everything. A year later, same races, same conditions, same, same, more or less the same chance. And 104 and 105, and big Singapore punters were having this on and that on. And it literally changed massively in Australia in a, in a space of two years. I remember telling Paul that there was a horse called Denman, a flat horse, same name as mine, and it ran in a race and. Um, it was, and the price was, it was two to seven, one to three and two to seven for real big, big, real big money. And I said to Paul, in two years' time, if that race was run again, Denman will be eight on. And he thought I was mad. And two years later, he said, you were wrong about it being eight on, it'd be 10 on. And he's right. And now, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's not. And I stand, I stand, you know, you know, you look at, you look at the price of all the skinny ones now. They're, they're, I guarantee you now there's not a man alive betting short odds horses now, getting a game, getting a living at it. There's not one. There's not one person going around betting five and six on chances and making it pay. Not one. And there used to be plenty. And there used to be a few of the dogs. We used to, I used to go and bet, I used to love betting marathon dogs. It was the biggest turn on in my life, it still is. Betting short price marathon dogs. And I'd go all over the country doing it. And, um, but there was other people doing it as well. And, um, you know, now, well, even now, with dogs, even with, if there is a bit of value with, the, with, the, with the dogs and marathon dogs now, they could possibly be on Betfair, but that would be about it. There's, it, it, it. It's really the lowest, if, that, that, if there's one part of the market that's been sucked to death, it's the, it's the, it's the, real, it's the real short prices. 
That, that's that's for sure. And you mentioned uh, a very shrewd dre- judge that got it horribly wrong about Frankel. Oh, uh, oh, the call. No, that was the, the worst call of all time. Well, the great thing about Frankel was he was such a... Everyone knew what kind of temperament he had, even from um, the early days, whereas she was the complete opposite. I mean, for me, for two horses to go unbeaten, it's just every horse gets beat. I looked in the history of Ajax, the great Australian horse, going back. That got beat, that only got beat one to, one to 50. Imagine what price the Ajax was that day. One to 50 in the old days. But even Ajax got beat. Nuriev, Shergar, every good horse gets beat. So how was it possible that exactly the same time, in different parts of the world, Frankel, a colt, and the mayor were both unbeaten for so long? And what's incredible, no one ever talks about this about the two horses is, every single time Black Caviar won, never ever once did she go odds against him running. I was there when she won a second ever race, stood with Carl Burke at Mooney Valley. And never once in any of her races did she go odds against? And yet, Frankel, I guarantee, in running, different type of horse, in most of his races, he'd have gone odds against. And um, who can ever forget the, that call for Jim McGrath's in the Guineas when uh, it's the only race I can think of, really, that I wish I'd been there to see it when Frankel blitzed the Guineas from the thing and sat watching it at home. Well, the first thing you heard was Jim McGrath say, well, he won't win many races running like that. And I just thought, how on earth could you watch Frankel do that in the Guineas? There's every single person on the race course, all their hair would have been stood up on the back of their neck. Then I'm not talking about after the race, I'm talking about halfway, when you know, oh my God, he's shitting. You know, we all had our doubts at five furlongs, at maybe at halfway, then all of a sudden you just knew, they ain't gonna get near him. And uh, I'll never forget that negative comment straight as across the line, I just thought, well, you know, and I, I think it's very important in gambling to be able to spot class very quickly whether it's Steve Davis, Federer, Johnny Higgins, Hendry. See, I served my apprenticeship at the snooker. And, um, you know, like little Johnny Higgins, I still speak to his brother now, I speak to John. I was in his seat when the Celtic beat Rangers. And, um, you know, you bump in, I bumped into John when he was 13, 14. I mean, I got a lot of money out of John Higgins. You gotta be in the right place at the right time. First match he ever played was Gary Wilkinson. We all thought, what price is it gonna be? What price is it gonna be? And uh, uh, anyway, 11 to four he was, 11 to four to two to one, and he won five three. But uh, I can't tell you how many people were at the snooker. I remember Ronnie's first game. When Ronnie O'Sullivan played John Parrott, it was Ronnie's first ever match at the assembly rooms, at the, at, not the assembly, no, not the, the hexagon at Reading. And the place was mobbed. Honestly, right up the back, the, everyone was there to see Ronnie play John Parrott. And do you know what, it was five to six each or two, and I'm ashamed to say I can't remember who won. <laughs> now, when you talk, your enthusiasm for every sport, you can, it can just emanate from you. Yeah. But you were, we've talked about all the sports, but very little about what you were Harry the dog, weren't you? I mean, oh, tell us gosh. about your love of grounds and why. Well, uh, we go back to the book again, but the Big Fella Thanks chapter, I, I, I'd have just had that, just the Big Fella Thanks chapter. And, um, you know, if they make the, if people talk about a film, it's just like the film about Big Fella Thanks was an ethereal experience. Um, because of the lads that died and the whole story. And um, we had Big Fella Thanks as a pet and he turned out as an older dog to be even more of a wondrous dog than he was in a Corson field. And he had a world record 31 courses. But um, the only reason I haven't got a retired dog yet now is because we lost Sid about six months ago in case full-time care at the moment or, or there'd be a dog here. And you know, I, I can't explain how much I love. I was at Shelbourne Park Saturday night for the night at the Stars, I was in the restaurant um, first three or four races and went outside to watch the fourth row. Outside, forget, don't watch them behind glass. And outside's the place, the place to, to watch dog racing. And just, when you haven't seen them for a while and they go past you, you just think, what a sight, what a great sight. I'll never forget watching Bally Regan Bob run his best ever race. Um, first race in, in, in an A2, which was a top grading race. And um, I watched that behind glass and they went past together and. Bally Regan Bob won, but beat Lulu's hero by a head. And I said to my brother, I said, I should have watched that outside. And Lulu's hero was a six bend dog and Bally Regan Bob got in trouble. And he was like three and a half lengths behind him at the second bend. And I thought, well, we're a million. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have backed Bally Regan Bob at a million to one and he got up and won by a head. And it's funny, I read um, a piece from Floyd Amphlett's thing yesterday and it was John Martin in 19, and he was slagging off Bally Regan Bob. So he never run against four Ben dogs. 
He never done ran over one in the derby. Never did this, and he said it's a disgrace that everyone's talking about his world record. Well, I ain't being funny. John Martin, John Martin must have been wearing Aidan O'Brien sunglasses with sheets on because Barry Regan Bob, I've watched all the best in America, all the best in Australia, all the best in England and Ireland. And Barry Regan Bob is the most all-round greyhound I've ever seen in my life. And how, how can you judge him? I mean, he, the way he beat Ballin Tubber, one four seven five at Walthamstow, but maybe it's, he's 500 yards in a straight line against them all. I'd still have Barry Regan Bob. The amazing thing about Barry Regan Bob is he stayed 800 metres. He might even have stayed 820. And when you when you look at the Australian racing now, and I'll, part of the reason why I'm not making them skinny ones pay is because these six bend dogs, Australian dogs, they go over six bends, and after two or three races, they've had enough. So if anything, Barry Regan Bob's because the breeding, that Irish breeding, that Irish breeding is not there, and they get three or four times 650 metres. That's enough. But Barry Regan Bob. 30 of 30 races over six bends and amongst them some freaky races at Romford the whole thing I just I just for someone to I was just taken aback that John Martin could possibly be Valerie Regan Bob so you don't need to ask who the best dog I've ever seen is um you know who it is were, were you were you hooked the first time you went oh the first racing? first race first race and first what, race what I, was it what was it that it was you? it was a graded race at Slough first race at Slough on a Saturday night two hours before the race I didn't know that Grand Racing existed. I'd been to Newbury the first day at the horses. They said, let's go at the dogs. They were public school boys from Slough. Clyde Birchmore and his mates. But, you know, and uh, I said, dog racing. And they explained it. I'd never seen a Grand. I'd never seen a Whippet or a Grand or a Lurcher. I didn't know. And when they told me, and I sort of half didn't believe it, and I watched the first race at the third bend at Slough Dogs, and it was as if I'd been hit by an electric shock. And, um, no, it, it, and then I was at Wembley, six o'clock, when, when I heard that there was grand racing at Wembley Stadium, I thought they were taking the piss. And there was grass in those days. I was there, I said to my mate Dylan, come on, we've got to get on the train. Straight from school, down the hill, half past four, train to Wembley, we were there knocking the door down. I walked all the way around, looked at the track, I mesmerised, mesmerised. And I was a great, and I'm not being funny, I was a good judge. That's why grand racing is so sellable, because you can become a good judge of the dogs in, in no time. When we, run, when we have Liffle, we're going to have the form. Because everyone's going to know who's going to lead. But people know anyway, because the dogs are so reliable. They're so consistent. It's the only sport in the world that was made for gambling. And uh, we're going to turn the clock back like it used to be in the 20s and the 30s, when it was a 6% takeout. And the game was absolutely flying. If Bally Regan Bob had scored a low champ and been, been around 30 years earlier, they'd have had the, the, I don't know what would have happened. They'd, they'd have been sold out if, you know, forever. And of course... My relationship with the great Don Cuddy before he died, me and Don Cuddy were like best people training my dogs and we, we, you know, we had some good dogs up on a golf course and um, we don't talk about the Larry stuff in the book, but we used to, we had Don, Donald Leahy with us and we'd have the dogs in trials and, and I, knew, I, knew, I knew didn't have long, Don didn't have long and we had, we were 15 minutes from Doncaster Airport and Leeds were playing at the Champions League at the time. So if Leeds were at home, we'd stay at home for the midweek and if Leeds were away, we'd go and we'd get a Julia jet and go and watch the, the free matches Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in Europe and come back. And Don was the, Don was the most, you'd take him anywhere and meet all the lads in Barcelona and everything and he was just the most wonderful man to be around. He was a very tough dog man all his life. But in those last two, two or three years, I, I got the very best of Don Cuddy and um, they were really special times.